Cool, so I'm going to kick us off. My name is Amelia Neptune. I am the director of the Bicycle Friendly America program. And you are in the session, everything you wanted to know about Denver's e-bike uh, rebate program, but we're afraid to ask. We have a great lineup of speakers who Christina Costa will introduce um, in a moment, but I'm just gonna start with a couple housekeeping notes. The session is being recorded, which means you can share the link afterwards with anyone who missed it, or if you wanna rewatch it, you're more than welcome. For those in the room, this owl creature is capturing us. So just know that it's gonna be part of the recording as well, especially when I'm speaking or if anyone else in the room is speaking. Um, attendees, we encourage you to put your questions in the Zoom chat as opposed to the Whova chat so that our speakers can see that easily. And if you're in the room, uh, you can either log into Zoom and type your questions there, or we've got note cards and pens on the tables. You can pass them back to Kevin in the back of the room, um, and he can put them in the chat for you. Closed captions are available. You can turn them on and off at any time. Um, please make sure your name and pronouns and organization or location are in your Zoom name. Uh, and join us online uh, at hashtag Bike Summit 23. And thank you, of course, to our sponsors. Um, and I, before we get started, I wanted to clear the air that uh, you all who are here to lobby are one of the things we're going to be asking for is the um, e-bike act, uh, which is a federal level e-bike rebate program. Um, and today you'll be hearing about a local uh, e-bike rebate program. And I know when I first heard about the federal one, I had a lot of questions about this session. Is it going to be obsolete? What, you know, do they cancel each other out? And I'm here to reassure you that uh, both programs can coexist. Uh, people can be eligible for both. Karen Whitaker assured me that the way it will work is um, the federal bill would be for your federal taxes, and what you're hearing about today is for local uh, uh, programs, so um, they don't conflict. Kevin, if you can keep an eye on the waiting room, I see more people coming in. Thanks. Um, and uh, the other thing Karen noted was that the Federal E-Bike uh, Act uh, is probably still a few years away. So encouraging local programs like the one in Denver is still a really good move. And um, there's nothing to say a local program couldn't be stronger and you know higher higher amounts, higher standards uh, than the federal one. So um, I, I encourage you to learn more about the E-Bike Act. And at the uh, in a moment, I'll put some links in the chat for our um, virtual folks to sign our um, action alert to encourage Congress to adopt this. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Christine. I'll stop sharing uh, my screen. And Christine, thank you so much for uh, moderating for us today. My pleasure. Thank you, Amelia. Well, I say my pleasure, but let's let's see how my slideshow goes. <laughs> OK, so let's see now. Slideshow and play. All right, attendees, give me a verbal. Do you see my first slide, the welcome slide? Yep. Yeah. Super. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Well, thank you all very much for being here uh, th to, for this session. Everything you want to know about Denver's e-bike voucher program at the 2023 National Bike Summit. We've got some great speakers lined up who are gonna share the stories and details of creating and launching local e-bike voucher programs. I'm Christina Costa, your moderator. I founded a social enterprise called Pedal Power Promoters in 2014 to advance bicycle friendliness, micro mobility, and all forms of active transportation. In addition to my consulting, I am an advocate on the board of Walk Bike Tampa and a volunteer and supporter of Denver Streets Partnership and Denver's Bike Streets, creators of the Vamos Network Plan. I had the great privilege of knowing uh, the two cities we're going to talk about today and consider both Denver and Tampa, Florida hometowns. And I use my e-bike as a primary mode of transportation in both cities. I'm going to give you our agenda overview now so you know what's coming and I'll also be introducing our speakers. First, we're going to hear from Mike Salisbury from the city and county of Denver. Mike is uh, uh, the transportation energy lead in the sustainability and resiliency office and his work is centered on basically uh, electrifying all modes of transport 
uh, in, in the Denver region. And um, this is one of many programs that he has underway. He is highly credentialed, as you can see here, um, having his master's degree from the Center for Urban, uh, or rather for Energy and Environmental Policy. He worked for Congressman Mike Castle as a fellow focused on energy and environmental issues and did a Peace Corps stint. Uh, we know that uh, the engagement and support of the bike shop industry is critically important, and I think both city speakers will echo that. And for that reason, we have Mackenzie Hart as a panelist. And Mackenzie has been in the industry for over 10 years. He opened the Hart Family Cyclery in 2021, middle of the pandemic. That's probably a a story that would take, uh, that would be interesting to this crowd in and of itself. Uh, in addition to being the business owner operator, Mackenzie is an advocate. Locally, he focuses on assisting with policy development that is equitable and community centered. And he works uh, to advance the knowledge and comfort of children uh, using bicycles by sponsoring the and organizing the area's critical uh, critical mass. Uh, bike rides. And I just love this motto. I had to share his motto, which he shared with me. Everybody can ride a bike. We're going to hear some testimonials, uh, an excerpt from this great video. And before the end of the uh, presentations, you'll each have links to the videos that we have as additional content for you. The uh, video put together by Bicycle Colorado and Active Towns, John Zimmerman. Uh, we're just going to take a quick peek at that video during this presentation so we can hear end user testimonials. And then we're going to travel south to go to Tampa, Florida, where Austin Britt is the uh, planning, a uh, parking planning coordinator, and he joined the city of Tampa not even a year ago. Um, and despite his young age, he's already on an encore career because he was a teacher and left the education industry to pursue his passion of um, regional and urban planning. He has a graduate certificate uh, in resiliency and community development, and he worked with the team in Denver as well as Tampa's local bike shops to create the program he's going to tell us about. Of course, we are reserving time for questions and answers. And so now I'll stop sharing and hand it over to Mike. Great, thank you so much, Christine. And uh, thank you to all the organizers, the National Bike Summit. It's really exciting to be here today, um, albeit virtually. Um, it's just uh, a great conference, great group of people on this panel. So really excited to be here today. Let me get my slides going. So again, Mike Salisbury, um, and I apologize, I went to the dentist today, so the left half of my mouth is numb. So I think I sound normal to myself, but if I sound really weird, that's my excuse today. Um, so there we go. Um, so again, I work in the city of Denver's Office of Climate Action, Sustainability and Resiliency. We're a relatively new office, uh, but our goal is again to sustainably and rapidly rapidly and equitably decarbonize Denver. And my role is really around, as Christine mentioned, that transportation piece. So both reducing greenhouse gases from the transportation sector via kind of both electrifying everything with wheels, but also finding ways to improve mobility and give residents more mobility options. So I'm gonna start with one piece, uh, it's looking ahead but it really is critical to Denver's e-bike program is the funding piece. So Denver, we're a very, very fortunate city. In uh, 2020, Denver voters approved a sales tax measure that provides uh, my office about $40 million a year to fund, implement uh, programs in the city. So transportation is one of the six allowable uses. And so there's a slice of that pie that goes into programs that I manage and run. And so this is where the funding for the e-bike uh, voucher came from. So that is probably one of the first questions I hear from other cities and entities interested in this is, where is the funding coming from? So again, we're very fortunate in Denver, we have dedicated climate funding that allows us to do uh, our e-bike program, certainly, especially at the scale we have been able to do it um, in Denver. 
So very quickly, I'm going to hit on the a little bit of the origin story of the e-bike voucher. This came out of as I, over the course of 2020, as we were looking towards potential ballot measure to fund climate work, uh, there was a whole climate action task force convened um, in Denver, brought together stakeholders from across the city, all kinds of different sectors, business, utility, you know, all kinds of uh, you know disadvantaged communities. So a really broad coalition of people uh, to kind of give us guidance. It wasn't just the idea like, hey, we're gonna give the city a lot of money and we trust them to spend it well. There was a real effort to develop a plan and give us, you know, here's what we should be doing. If this funding becomes available, then here's what you should be doing. So one of the, I think, important recommendations that came out of this climate action task force is just right here, like focus on incentives uh, for e-bikes. So that was, we heard from the community, and we started to work on this after the funding did pass in 2020, started to work on this in 2021, pulling lots of different pieces together, again, reaching out to community members, uh, talking to like champion bike shops like McKenzie and other bike shops who are already like really active and engaged in the e-bike space. And then, you know, eventually we launched the program. And so I forgot I had this slide. Um, so just real quick, you know, e-bikes are awesome. Uh, there's so many great benefits to them. There's the health benefits, there's the mobility benefits, there's reducing congestion benefits, there's climate benefits. And so we just see so much potential in e-bikes. And this is kind of just a snapshot of why that we think that is, is about, you can see 67% of car trips in Denver are less than 10 miles. And we feel like, you know, e-bikes have this amazing potential to replace a lot of those trips. You know, the longer trips too for some people, but these are trips that can be relatively easily replaced. With, you know, so one or two people uh, can be replaced with an e-bike. So that's why we're really excited about potential uh, e-bikes in Denver. So as I mentioned, the program launched uh, last April, almost a year ago. Uh, it started out with these incentive amounts. And I think the really critical thing for us was that it was a point of sale rebate. That was something that was really important for us to try to figure out a way to make sure that an incentive was available upfront to Denver residents, especially we have two tiers. So the income qualified residents uh, were really, it was very clear to us after speaking with lots of people doing community outreach that a after sale refund was not something that those residents were going to be able to take advantage of. They did not have the ability or the capital to wait several weeks for the city to, to write them a check in return. So it was very important for us to make sure it was a point of sale rebate so it would be most accessible to the most number of Denver residents. And so we launched and immediately were happily overwhelmed by the demand in the program. So we started off when this launched, we're like, well, you know, it's going to be great if we can spend about $300,000 in 2022 on this e-bike program. That's kind of what we had budgeted. It's going to be great. We're going to learn a lot of good lessons, and then we'll be able to move forward uh, in 2023 with something else, something better. And so what happened in 2022 is we spent about almost $5 million on e-bike incentives in the city of Denver, had just massively more demand for the vouchers than we were able to fund with the budget we had. Over almost 5,000 e-bikes were purchased in 2022. Things that were really, I think, excited about that split was about 50-50 between uh, a general residence, you'll say, and then the income qualified residence. So we really tried to make sure that a lot of the benefits of the program were flowing to disadvantaged and lower income Denver residents. And because the numbers are 50-50 split, but the voucher amount was so much higher, we ended up spending almost 70% of the funding that was spent in 2022 went to those income qualified residents. Uh, I think what was exciting for us is in the fall, we did a survey of the e people who had bought an e-bike in 2022. And we finally got some, I think, really good data on how people were using their e-bikes. That was a really fundamental question. Everyone asked us, like, are they really replacing vehicle trips? Are they really accomplishing the goals that the city is trying to accomplish? And what we saw is that on average, people were riding their bike about 26 miles, replacing about three and a half vehicle trips per week. Uh, I think excitingly, about 70% of people were saying we're using our car less. Uh, so 29% of people weren't even cyclists before. So we're bringing in new cyclists into the city. 
which is very exciting. I think one other interesting piece is that we see the income qualified residents are riding their e-bikes about 50% more miles per week. So it's also providing them, I think, a more robust mobility option that they're using for more trips uh, to do more things with their e-bike than they were doing before. So that was 2022. We've just relaunched the program in 2023. We had our first round of applications for vouchers go out in January. We'll help, we're relaunching. We have a March round going out tomorrow. So a couple things that we adjusted, uh, I think a little bit of lessons learned. Uh, we changed some of the voucher amounts. Um, we staggered the application uh, time, or we changed the application time. It had been at like eight o'clock in the morning. We shifted that to later in the day so that uh, essentially the libraries would be open because that's an online resource where a lot of people will access the internet, be able to apply. They can actually use their library. The library, Denver Public Library staff has digital navigators that can help people and assist them if they're having trouble with the application. So that's like a resource where we wanted to make available to people who might not have easy access to the internet at their home. Um, another thing we're working on is working with uh, community-based organizations to give vouchers directly to people that those organizations identify uh, because, as I mentioned, the demand for vouchers is so much higher than our ability to fund it. Um, the application process is goes very quickly. Within 10, 15 minutes, all the applications we have available for a month are taken up. So it can be a very frustrating process for people. So we wanted to find another way to get vouchers into the hands of people who kind of might be able to make the most use of them, but also might be likely to not be the people who are like, yes, I can be online at this exact time and apply with fast internet and have all my documents ready to go. So trying to make the access to the vouchers more access, access more accessible to people. And then we also have added an additional voucher working with two bike shops in Denver that sell adaptive e-bikes. So that someone who has a disability who's not able to ride a regular e-bike would also be able to take advantage of the program. So just really quickly, some lessons learned, I think, is just that the demand is huge. People are really excited about e-bikes. Uh, we tried to keep everything as simple as we could, um, keeping the application simple, uh, not asking a million questions from people, hopefully just not needing to prove their resident, need to then prove if they want to get the income qualified voucher, they have to show some kind of income qualification documents. Uh, again, point of sale is really critical. Uh, working with local bike shops like um, Heart Family Cyclery is really, they're our best champions. They're the ones on the front lines selling these bikes and interacting with customers. So it's been super valuable to us to have that local element. Uh, I think thinking about outreach in disadvantaged communities as soon as possible, even, you know, we, there's a lot of weird, lot, the program got lots of great media, lots of great press, people are very aware of it, but there's still lots of work that needs to be done, like education, uh, making sure people in those communities understand, hey, this is what e-bike is, we need to have events and do that outreach to make sure that uh, they know the potential of the e-bike, get them, you know, test rides, uh, I think, you know, e-bikes are great because once it's one of those things you do it for the first time, you're like, this was so cool. That was awesome. But you have to get on the bike and try that out before you have that experience and understand how cool they are. Um, and then I'll just say, you know, it's really, you know, hard, but uh, as much as possible, pairing things with bike, safe biking infrastructure, but then also looking at secure bike storage are two things that are, you know, if we can do this all at the same time, those are three really important things to be doing. Um, not always easy to do all three at the same time. And I just, there's a great report that came out recently from Ride Report with some other great partners. Uh, so there's a link at the bottom of the page. It's lots of great background information and um, touching on more, going into more depth about some of the points I've raised today. And that is my slides. And I'm going to pass this over to Mackenzie Hart. Thank you, everyone. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm really excited to be a part of this today to kind of explain how my interaction has been with this program as a bike shop owner. So I operate a fairly small bike shop here in Colorado. 
Uh, I'm single owner, sole proprietorship. So I do everything from mop the floors to fix the flats to sell really expensive and affordable e-bikes all at the same time. So my job is to work with families and individuals to find the right solution for them to get them out of the car and back on the road on a bicycle, uh, spending less time in a vehicle, more time out in our beautiful sun. Um, it's been really fun getting to work with Mike and the city of Denver on this program. Some keys to the success to this program from a retailer's perspective is gonna be how they started out at the beginning with this program. So before the rebates were out and offered to our consumers, they worked very hard to talk to local individuals, not just our consumers, but also our local retailers, uh, working to see how is this gonna work for retail shops with large staff, small staff, how is this gonna work with the different point of sale systems that we all use in different types of bike shops? So whether you're a large national shop or a local individual shop like myself, how is this gonna actually work for us? Um, a big part of that was making sure that we would be funded at appropriate times. So the way our program worked was I offer a discount at the time of sale. So as someone comes to my register, I discount their bike. Um, and then I float the cost of that until the city can repay me. So it was really important to know that the city was going to repay me uh, in a timely fashion to make sure I can pay my bills and buy more bikes. Uh, and they did a great job of that. So making sure that they had all their ducks in a row before the program started, they had a great plan of attack and were ready to roll. Um, was really helpful. So everything from the finances to the staff to also just what the definition of a cargo bike is. So it's really important to note that cargo bikes can offset more carbon emissions and replace more car trips, but do cost more to produce. So helping families and individuals that want a cargo bike to receive a different amount was really helpful um, for different families to get the bike they needed that worked for them, but knowing what that real amount should be. And you'll see in some of the slides uh, that Mike went over that things have changed. Uh, those numbers have changed over the last two years. Uh, and that is the next kind of key to success for this program that I see is Denver's ability to fluctuate, Denver's ability to kind of roll with the punches and change things as they go. And I think that can be difficult at times for cities, and municipalities to do, but vitally important um, and super exciting for me to see and be a part of is seeing the city take our feedback seriously, listening to bike shops. I can pick up the phone and call Mike and tell him what I love, what I hate, what's working, what's not. Um, having someone respond to those calls, respond to those emails and hear us out and then actually implement real life change um, in this next round of rebates was really exciting to see. So everything from changing dollar amounts to the number of rebates to the time of day that they put them out. It's really cool to see someone that's able to be flexible because if you write a program year one by year three, it's just not the same. Um, we have actually changed the way bikes and e-bikes are used in Colorado and in Denver based off of the rebate program. So the way it'll be utilized in the future is gonna be different just because we've put more bikes out there. We've put different types of bikes out there. And so seeing a city that can roll with that, I think is really helpful. Um, another key to success is gonna be the communication side of things. So watching the language that Mike put, puts out there each month when he's sending us monthly emails, giving us the resources to where we can match that language on our newsletters, on our websites, on our social media, making sure we're all communicating well with our customers and with the general public has been so helpful to make sure that they are informed as to what's going on. Um, with these changes happening from time to time, it's vitally important that we communicate that to our folks. Um, and so having a city that communicates well is really important. I think this shows that even a larger city like Denver can do this. I think it can be really um, supportive and really easily done in smaller towns and cities. But to see a city as big as Denver, put forth the effort and find the right folks to run this program was exciting uh, to be a part of. Um, some numbers that we have for my specific shop. Uh, the kind of show you the success of this program is we saw our numbers go up about 30% in sales um, from the actual start of the rebate program. It's hard to know if we can attribute all of that to it. Um, we, we do think uh, anecdotally from our customers that a large part of that was there. Um, but the hard number that I can share with you, which is my most exciting number, is that Hart Family Cycling replaced 112 cars last year. So we had 112 families or individuals either not buy a second vehicle or actually sell a vehicle to purchase an e-bike and not have to use that car anymore, but be able to use the bike in place of that car. And that is a huge deal. That is tens of thousands of miles off the road. That is tens of thousands of pounds of CO2 out of our environment. And that is tens of thousands of smiles on folks riding throughout the Denver area. Because we all know if you can spend a day on a bike, you're a better person than if you were stuck in a car in the back of a bus. I know bikes have not only been recreational for me, but have always been a way for me to work with mental health. 
And so not only working with physical health, mental health, but our ecological health has been really important to this program and part of its main success. So keeping a nice kind of hometown feel to a really large program, it's not just about the millions of dollars, but it's about the individuals and the families we've seen and the life-changing uh, effects it's had on those individuals. Um, so I would encourage other municipalities to get involved, but I would stress some of those key features of please work with your local bike shops. Programs like this can make or break your local infrastructure, your local bike shops, and your local economy. Uh, this program was done very well, and the key to that success was communication. We want to see that moving forward, and we want to continue to expand this into our state and federal programs as well. Um, from there, I'll pass it back to our moderator and see what else we can do from here. Thank you very much. And I appreciate you um, really um, being very clear about what is what success is defined as. And your numbers are exciting and it's uh, wonderful to see from the local economy perspective. I'm going to launch the video now so we can hear the end user information. So let's see. Let me see if I can do this. Do you all see the video? <laughs> Give me a verbal, thank you. Thanks, Mackenzie. All right, here we go. We're only gonna watch an excerpt of this, an excerpt, uh, but as I mentioned, you'll get the link to this video and another um, in the chat before we conclude our session. Here we go. So we like to go school downtown, pick my son up, and then we go back home. But we also like to take the bike. We start exploring different playgrounds in the neighborhoods. Uh, he loves to go to Target. We go to the grocery store and small errands, friends' houses, things like that. I use the e-bike every day. The only days I wouldn't use it if the weather is really bad. I like to ride to work, from work, really just making small errands as I make my way through the day. I had to carry everything on my back. And so having the space for cargo with groceries or at the hardware store, that makes a big difference. I have a four week old daughter who I'm excited to, for her to get on this. And I actually had my parents out in town and my mother, my 70 year old mother rode this from Denver to Morrison and back. And she wouldn't have been able to ride, ride with us without, without the assist. And so it was, that, that made such a difference in our day. Our volunteers move food mainly using bicycles with attached trailers. Every weekend, our volunteers ride hundreds of miles with these bikes. It feels so much easier to move food using this electric bike than it does on a non-electric bike. Even the hill on this little bridge across the Platte can be challenging if you have a lot of food in the back of your bike. I work two and a half miles from my home. I live on the north side of Denver. I work at the state capitol. I'm a state senator. And to be able to actually uh, ride my e-bike, and it's actually faster to get there on my e-bike than it is for me to drive in. Some of the places that I ride to are the Auraria campus every morning, um, to the grocery store, and then just cruising around. Um, honestly, I just ride. In the five weeks I've been riding, I put 800 miles on it. Uh, yeah, so my bike is a family e-bike. Uh, my daughter is two years old. She and I ride everywhere, every chance we get. Um, she adores sitting on the back of it, and uh, it's, it's great for transportation. It makes life a lot easier. My hope right now is to commute at least two out of four days a week to school. I ride it to go to work, run errands, and just to get around my town. I love it. Super. So I hope you all enjoyed that, those little, that's just enough to whet your appetite. I did play it at a faster speed than normal just to keep us all on track for our session. And now I will turn it over to Austin in Tampa, Florida. All right, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you guys can hear me and see my screen. Yes. I am incredibly excited to have the opportunity to be here today and share kind of the secondhand experience of what putting together an e-bike program looks like. Um, I will say we were very fortunate to not be the first ones to do this program because we were able to take a lot of what Denver did and some of those lessons learned and make sure that we incorporate that into uh, our program the first time. <laughs> um, but we are very thankful to the support of Denver and everyone who has helped us put this program together. And I'm really excited to share with you uh, about the program that we put together here for the city of Tampa. So first and foremost, just like Mike said, the goal of this program was to provide a reliable, affordable and sustainable transportation option to all of our city of Tampa residents. We wanted as many people as possible to be able to apply for and be benefited by this program. Um, and also like Mike mentioned, we, we wanted this program to be an upfront discount because a lot of our residents don't have the money in order to upfront you know, several thousand dollars and wait for the city to pay them back. Uh, and so we, we do, we're doing that upfront discount uh, at the point of sale for the, for the purposes of our application. And uh, similar to the city of Denver's program, 
our project or our vouchers range in value from $500 to $2,000, depending on the type of voucher that you're applying for. And I won't spend too much time on this slide. I think uh, Mike explained it really well. Why we went with the voucher over a rebate was really to provide all residents, even those who are income challenged or restricted with the opportunity to benefit from this program. So we're, for the purposes of our program here in the city of Tampa, only including class one e-bikes and class one e-cargo bikes. Um, that has just came out of a, a, a really a, a push from our legal team. Um, and I'm hopeful that once we see the support uh, and the interest in the program, we'll be able to kind of grow and expand our offerings moving forward. Um, for our income qualification vouchers, we decided to use, rather than the federal uh, median income, we're using the city of Tampa's median income as reported by the census data, um, which is $59,893, just as another incentive and another method to provide as much opportunity for as many people as possible to participate in the program. Um, and below there, you can see just some of the different types of in, uh, individual uh, documentation that they can provide in order to uh, meet that qualification. Um, something we're doing that's a little bit different from Denver. Um, we saw that their program has massive success, massive interest, um, and a lot of those relate to like they a, a lot of the the interest is right there at 8 a.m. You know when the program application opens. Um, so our our plan to kind of combat that a little bit was to offer a lottery process for the selection of our individuals. That way we're gonna keep the application process open for two weeks. Individuals will have that full two week period to apply. That way we can make sure that individuals that don't have reliable internet or internet at all at home, have the opportunity to go out and fill out one of these applications. Um, and then we're going to, out of the set number of vouchers that we have based on our current funding, which is $170,000 for this first round, uh, we have broken our vouchers into four buckets and have allotted a certain number of vouchers per each type. Um, and so we're going to randomly choose names out of a hat, essentially, uh, for who gets a voucher, just to make it a little bit more equitable and fair to all of the individuals here within the city of Tampa. Um, and here you can see the four different types of e-bikes we have along with their values. Uh, we have two standard uh, vouchers that anyone in the city of Tampa can apply for, the regular e-bike voucher for $500 and the e-cargo bike for $1,000. And then for our income qualified individuals, we've doubled those two base vouchers. So the e-bike for income qualified uh, individuals is $1,000 and the e-cargo bike is $2,000. Um, and we're, we were really thankful that we were able to work with our local bike shops in order to develop this program and offer it to our residents. I believe we have seven uh, of our local bike shops that are already signed up to participate in this first round of the program. Um, and another thing that we wanted to make sure of was that you know these bikes are a really big investment. And if you're going to spend that much money on an e-bike, we, you're going to want somewhere to park it safely <laughs> or securely. Um, and so in tandem with this program, we are also working on rolling out, uh, uh, we've branded it Bike Safe. We're not uh, quite ready to roll it out yet, but as part of that program, we're going to have um, all of our downtown uh, garages have these beautiful murals with bike racks installed on top of them. And uh, the city of Tampa's parking division is working to install video cameras that our security uh, team is going to monitor 24-7. Um, just to provide that extra sense of security and incentive to utilize your e-bike to offset those transportation tricks. Um, if you guys would like any more information about our program, please don't hesitate to reach out to me or reach out uh, to our program website, which is tampa.gov forward slash e-bike. And I hope that was fast enough in the interest of our time. I will now uh, share it back to our moderator so that we can take some of your questions. Thank, thank you, Austin. Uh, let me see. I'm going to. I think someone else has to stop sharing for me to just get to our Q and A page. Okay, good. Did I not got it? Okay. No, you're good. You're good. <laughs> good. So, here we have. So we're delighted to take uh, questions that have come in through the chat or through. Um, um, you know, right there in the room. So Amelia and Kevin, I defer to you now on managing Q&A. Great. Um, and I wanna say thank you to Mike for answering some of the questions that have already come in on the chat. So uh, for those in the room, since you aren't able to chat with the attendees, any questions in the room that I can uh, relay or feel free to just speak up? Yeah, go ahead, Jack. Any questions, please ask you a brief. 
Um, I'll repeat these for virtual let's attendees. Let's start with, how did you track the usage data, that feedback from the slide from Denver? So, my, yeah, that's talked about, hey, Gotcha. So first question was, how do you track uh, the data, the feedback, right. user how data? Many yeah, how many trips were replaced and so on? How is that data collected and tracked? Yeah, so in the fall, we sent out a survey to the first 3,000 people who had purchased e-bikes, and we got uh, results back from 1,000 people. And so that was their, you know, reporting out. That was what they reported out. So. We are looking to partner with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory this year to actually do some like live app tracking of participants. So we actually get some real world data because surveys are a lot better than nothing, but definitely are not uh, it's a snapshot of time. So lots of unanswered questions we still have. So we're still looking to do more uh, data tracking going forward, but it was a, through a survey that we did in the fall. Yeah. Were they able to track like any potential resale, like you um, buying something? So the question is, were you able to track any potential resale of existing e-bikes in the market? Like around someone buying a bike with the voucher and then reselling it. Is that the question? That, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um. So we do track well. So it's challenging. So we certainly, we track serial numbers. So every bike has a serial number. So we track that to make sure that we're not getting the same bike twice via a voucher somehow. It shouldn't happen, but we do track that. It's obviously really challenging because e-bikes, unlike lots of other things that have incentives like a heat pump, it, it, the e-bike is very mobile. Um, it's very hard to say, hey, person who got a, a, took this e or got the voucher, Prove to us six months later that you still own the sea bike. Um, I, I I imagine that there are some people who did that. They got the bike and then they turned around and sold it. It's also really hard to track that because you see something that gives you an add on Craigslist, and like I have no way via Craigslist to tell who that person was and track down their name um, and say, well, you clearly just got a voucher and you're clearly selling the bike you just got. So it's, it's, it's Craigslist is anonymous that way. So I don't know, I'm sure there's some level of that that has happened, um, but it's hard. It's very hard, challenging to track that. I see Mackenzie has his hand up. Maybe he has a good answer to the question. Yeah, I think I have some extra feedback on that. Um, in Denver specifically, reselling bikes is heavily controlled by Denver Police Department. Um, if you buy as a business, if you buy, sell, or trade bikes, you're considered a pawn shop. You have to have a pawnbroker's license. Um, our pawn shops typically will, will never accept e-bikes. And so that has really pushed it to the Facebook marketplace, as well as one specific shop we have in Colorado, Randy's Recycled Cycles, who deals with more used bikes than anybody else in the state. Um, and so from speaking to Randy personally, uh, when the rebate program started, he did get a lot of questions about um, before people would even use the rebate, like, hey, will you be able to buy this bike back for me? And kind of that whole scheme idea of people wanting to use the program to get a bike, to then sell a bike, to make some cash. And I think what really helped us out on this to avoid that situation was the pricing of the rebate. And so once you buy a new bike, as soon as you walk it off the lot, just like a new car, it's no longer new, it's used. And so because of the rebate number, if someone was to buy it and go to a store and actually sell it in store, what they're losing on that to resell it now as a used bike was enough of a difference that Randy saw he never had folks really come in for that. That wasn't something he actually saw. So he got questions on it. But once he talked to them and kind of walked them through the process, it wasn't something we actually saw a lot of. Now, once again, like Mike said, we can't say what's been done on Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist. But from what we've seen as bike shop owners, we have seen very little to none of that, which is we're hopeful is maybe also reflected on uh, Facebook as well. But hard to say. Great. And then real quick, I saw a question in the chat. Do e-bike voucher recipients help inform bike infrastructure investments? Not directly. So it's a little bit of a two-track process. I Our office does the e-bikes. There's a whole other department within the city, our Department of Transportation Infrastructure, 
that is responsible for building out the city's network of bike lanes, protected bike lanes. So, you know, I think probably people are relatively, you know, aware building out new protected bike lanes takes a long time, a long lead time to plan and deploy that kind of infrastructure. So I think we're starting to see, like we've shared data with that department about here's where all the people who are redeeming vouchers live. And here's, you know, some really basic feedback, like trying to think through, we're also trying to think through where people who are not redeeming vouchers or where, where's there's gaps and trying to match up those gaps with protected bike infrastructure. It's kind of really interesting to look at maps of like saying like, this neighborhood has no protected bike infrastructure, no high high comfort bike lanes, and also has very low voucher redemption amounts. So that might be a good indication that there's a that that infrastructure piece is still a barrier. So we're sharing lots of data with them, and that's kind of hoping hoping to inform their process about where they start planning to make their next round of investments. But it is obviously a pretty long build up time to go from like, hey, we think there should be a great new protected bike lane here. To actually getting that deployed, unfortunately. Great, and we have several questions in the room. Hi, thank you. Um, uh, this might not be your piece of the puzzle, but is there any indication that some of these new e-bike owners are, are helping to expand and diversify the base of support for you know infrastructure and other pro bike initiatives in your communities? Thank you. Um, I'll take this one. I would say yes. Um, from working with Bike Streets and the Vamos project here in Denver, uh, Avi Stoper, who started that program, has seen a large influx in volunteers and folks requesting to be a part of his program, helping find uh, safer infrastructure that currently exists in Denver. It's a really interesting program that he works with. Um, and he has seen a huge influx in those volunteers since the rebate program. Uh, what we're finding is just a larger number of folks on the road. Um, anyone in Denver could tell you we're seeing more and more bikes. It's gone up dramatically since the rebate program. Um, and that, I think, is leading to more folks wanting to be a part of that uh, advocacy part as well. I, I don't think there's any good numbers on it, but we are seeing more folks wanting to get involved. One piece on that is I think we we did, you know, from our survey, we did get some, I think, demographic. And I've heard all this data and also Anecdotally, bike shop owners have saying that we're seeing lots of younger people get into e-bikes. I think that before the demographic skewed a little bit older for some of the bike shops. And so the, they're seeing a lot more, you know, people in their 20s and 30s coming into the bike shops than more than they're seen before. So hopefully that is going to explain the universe. As Mackenzie said, I think we are anecdotally see lots of people like becoming advocates after they get the e-bike and they're like, oh, I don't feel as comfortable as I'd like to. So now I'm going to call my city council person and the, the mayor's office and advocate for that. But yeah, it's hard to like get hard data on that, but definitely seen a lot of anecdotal people uh, doing that outreach now that they have uh, gotten an e-bike. That's great. That is great so news. I know we have a lot more questions, but we are at time. So I'm going to ask folks who still have remaining questions to put them in the Whova chat from now on, and then the speakers will be able to respond to you there. Um, do any of our speakers have any closing words you'd like to say? I put I a did bunch want of to, links uh, in the chat. Go ahead, Christine. <laughs> Thanks, Amelia. Um, I wanted to again thank our speakers and also share that during our preparation for this session, we learned that there are so many talented and passionate individuals who put their time and energy into the creation of the Denver program. And so we'd be remiss if we didn't do a shout out and a thank you to everybody that spent you know, years before today um, advancing this kind of initiative. And so we just, say thank you very much. We love you and we're so grateful. Um, and I think that's that's a wrap on our on our session. Thank you, everybody. Wonderful. And with that, I also want to thank our sponsors for this session. And Christine, if you don't mind stopping your screen share, we do have a video from our title sponsor for this session, People for Bikes, um, that Kevin's going to play as people uh, depart the room. So I just want to again say thank you so much to our speakers and thank you uh, everyone for attending. Uh, really thrilled to have you here today and looking forward to the uh, next session uh, of the day, which is our uh, final plenary of the day at 5 p.m. Eastern. Um, so thank you.